um, test. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second day of the seventh annual One Mid Forum. I'm Brett Johnson, uh, founder and CEO of One Mid Place oh, Organizers. Um, like today, doing on this panel, oh, we're so. delighted to have uh, really the yeah. first four I'll, portals. I'll figure it. Let's get out of the way there. Um, the first four yeah, portals yeah. in the healthcare business. As you guys know, crowdfunding has become a major idea, uh, a, a very hopeful mechanism to fund growth companies, and particularly in the healthcare space, this could be very, very powerful, um, both because of the financial return, but because of the passion that people have to understand disease and cures. Um, so I will, the, our, our moderator uh, is Joe Johnson from BDO, an international law uh, accounting firm that's been so good to help support the event. And the speakers will introduce themselves, but um, I think uh, again the program will know is via Polywog, Health Funder, Healthios Exchange, and Venture Health, and they're they're really the ones that are out for, on the forefront of this whole business. So, um, Joe, I'll let you go ahead and take it over, and welcome. Good good morning, all. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm just going to jump and let them introduce themselves. Scott, you want to start? And Hi, everybody. I uh, appreciate being here. My name is Scott Jordan. I am the founder and CEO of Healthios Exchange, which is based in the Chicago suburb of Northbrook. I'm Greg Simon. I'm the CEO of Polywog, which is based in New York, and today we're announcing our new office in Santa Monica. I'm Andrew Ferguson, founder and managing director of Venture Health. And I'm Sean Shanson, a co-founder of Health Funder. So we're going to ask some questions and then we'll leave some uh, room at the end to uh, let you guys ask any questions that you might have. Um, I guess I'd like to start with Andrew. Andrew, um, the, the companies here are slightly different and your models are slightly different. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your models and your approach to equity crowdfunding? Sure. So um, I guess I'll begin by saying the obvious, which is um, Equity crowdfunding is in its early days. It's nascent. The market's developing. I think the four of us have different models. We, we, we chat about that. Um, it's exciting for me to see the different models um, being launched, to see which ones um, emerge, which ones are, are successful. In our case, our approach is really trying to solve uh, the problem of access by investors into extraordinary healthcare deals. So we're connecting accredited investors into healthcare opportunities that, that we think are amazing. Um, so, what are the underlying principles behind this, right? We need to um, have investor acquisition solved, and we have to get access to amazing deals. Um, and that's, that's the company we're building right now. And I'll say that um, this business that we've launched has been, um, in many ways, a result of, of, of launching and running, first building companies and selling them. Um, as a team, um, the founding partners in our venture fund, we've had um, 18 exits, and 15 of them made money. And so we've learned a bit about building companies and getting them exits. And then we've launched a couple of venture funds. And along the way, as we began to invest our venture funds, uh, we, we realized there was a strong latent demand by accredited investors to access these deals. And this business actually um, organically began to grow out of that. And my co-founder, who's in the room over there, Talat Imran, raise your hand. Um, Talat's a uh, little younger than me, and Talat made the observation that um, this market is clearly going to uh, have an online component which can allow us to scale certain aspects of what we do. But at the end of the day, what we do is um, we're, we're healthcare people. Um, our passion really is improving clinical outcomes. And this business for us is helping to solve for capital. This is by investors, it's for investors. And our underlying thesis is that for this business to be sustainable, the investors who come into this business need to make money. So. We're trying to solve the, the problem of access by investors to deals. I think other approaches are trying to solve access problems by entrepreneurs to capital. And that's a different, that's a different side of the coin. And that's not the side we're playing on. Okay. Thank you. Greg, um, same question. How are you set up? You consider yourself a financial innovation firm. At least that's how the quote. Can you expand on what uh, Andrew said and explain how you're set up? So, Polywog is trying to transform health from a cost to an asset. So we have three different ways of doing that. The one way is focused on raising money for companies that need between two and ten million dollars that are part of the healthcare transformation going on. These are companies that have made <coughs> started by funding from a foundation 
or SDIR grants, and they end up being pushed to the edge of needing a lot more money than foundations can give them and a lot less money than any VC wants to give them, and they're at too risky for the VC community. And so we end up losing literally thousands of ideas that never get tested. So part of our platform is to give accredited investors the opportunity to put their money where their passions are, to invest in these very lowly valued, because they're in the so-called value of debt companies, so that we have a chance to start having better failures, if you will. If the company fails in healthcare, it's part of the success. If a company fails and does one more pet food store online, you don't learn anything. But we're going to have a lot of Alzheimer's failures before we get to a success. We have to be willing to fund those. And because of the Jobs Act, you can with a much lower unit investment size and much more opportunity for the companies. Do you need me? Secondly, we're not just about funding the individual companies, but funding the healthcare sector. It's very ironic that the largest sector of our economy, health, if you floated it out into the ocean, as David Blumenthal said recently, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. And yet it's the least capitalized of our major sectors. So one of the things Polywag is focused on is how do you turn this into an asset class? How do you let people own the future of diabetes? How do you let people invest in the diseases that are affecting them, not just by insurance? So we're creating indexes that are first of a kind that allow us to measure what's going on with public companies in different sectors of the economy. The first index is what called CARE. It's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It measures the effect of Obamacare on a number of public companies. That will soon be licensed for exchange-traded funds, et cetera, that people can invest in. And thirdly, we're creating public venture funds, publicly registered venture funds, that people, anybody, can invest in for $5,000 minimum that will invest in the verticals of healthcare so we can start dealing with Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all of which is intended to help turn health from a cost into an asset by tapping, in some cases, the 7.5 million accredited investors who've never made an investment in a private company, and also tapping the general investing population who've never been able to get into a venture fund because of the barrier to entry, who now could get into these public funds at a very low unit size, all of which is intended to let us start owning the future instead of just insuring against it. If you're the CEO of Kellogg's, you can hedge the price of wheat. If you're the CEO of Aetna, you can't hedge anything. So that has got to change because one last point that we're trying to address, everybody who's turned 65 in this country since the revolution, of everybody, Half of them are alive today, and we're going to quadruple that number in the next 20 years. No society has ever experienced that. We're getting ready to, and we're going to have to change our approach to health because that's going to be the number one concern for all of us going forward. And if it hasn't been so far, you're lucky, but it will be. Okay, Greg, thank you. Um, Scott, how about uh, you are different than Polywog? Can you explain how you are different and how you're set up? Yeah, first of all, I'd, I'd like to applaud each one of the platforms here. Um, I've looked at each one of them, and they're very unique in their own ways. Uh, the way that we are different is that, first of all, we're an investment bank, so we come from it from a different perspective. And we're a registered FINRA broker-dealer and SEC compliant. Uh, we, the, the biggest difference is we do not have what they call adverse selection, which means we truly have an exchange, no different than the New York Stock Exchange, where we have buyers and sellers, issuers and investors, that we have over 5,000 companies on our site, and we give, you know, large um, uh, groups of uh, numbers of companies the ability to invest on the portal. Uh, we're a direct investing platform like Polywag, uh, we curate, but we don't. And what I mean by that is, is that we have a, we're going to have a scoring system, an algorithm that assesses the variables that correlate with ultimate success. So we've done a lot of research in putting this model together. So that will be a curation tool. But o overall, I would say the major difference between our site and Polywalk at this time is we do not have adverse selection, or what some people call the due diligence dilemma, which means the sites are curating certain deals, but what about the other deals? What about the deals you're not, you're not seeing? So, 
Sully. Thank you. Sean, last but not least. I think the biggest difference, at least for, for Health Funder compared to everyone else, is we're technology people first and foremost. And as we got into this business, we realized that health is enormously broad and every single little subsector is enormously complex and highly technical and has its own little world. And we realized that what's really lacking is the ability for all of these experts and people that are investing in these, all these various spaces to reach broader audiences, to reach people that are interested in what they're doing. And so our model that we're going to be launching soon is a marketplace approach that leverages the expertise of people, of anyone that's an average or anyone that's an experienced healthcare investor to bring other accredited investors in behind them and alongside them in the companies that they invest in because they're already doing due diligence. They're doing picking and choosing the best companies that they think. And so we think the best thing that we can do is be the technology that facilitates access for these, this vast majority of crowd investors. Sean, I'll, I'll start with you um, uh, this time. Uh, and you kind of mentioned it, that uh, healthcare and startup investing is very complex. And the industry is broad and very technical. Um, how does crowd, crowdfunding uh, deal with this breadth and complexity? I think the best way that it's dealing with it, and I think everyone here on the panel has come up with really great ways to deal with it, is we're really looking at a decoupling of expertise and capital to where in the past, especially in the early stages, this is what you saw in angel networks, is you see three guys that know anything about healthcare funding and another hundred guys that are tech guys or industry guys or farmers or something else and they're following um, the few guys that know what they're doing into the deals. So we want to replicate that effect, replicate the trust that people place in different, in p different ex more experienced people into an online world. And that comes from this decoupling of expertise and capital and building trust between the capital and the expertise so that the crowd investors feel comfortable following into someone's deal or some angel group's deal or some company's deal. And so that's the biggest thing that we think crowdfunding needs to be successful is we need to marry trust between the expertise and the capital that's being kind of decoupled. Thanks. Did any of the other panel members want to also answer that question, which is um, how does crowdfunding deal with the complexity? And well, if you look at the, is that mic working yet? No. Okay. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the history of investing, uh, complexity doesn't really come into it. People will buy whatever they are allowed to buy. People are buying exchange traded funds based on the market in Nigeria, and they can't find it on a map or central Mongolia. Um, the, the, what's, what's really exciting about what's going on now is that we're allowing a much broader group of investors to have access to the private economy. And that is going to change everything because the, the people who have been involved in the private economy since 1974 when they were allowed to invest as accredited investors have acquired $30 trillion of wealth. And everybody else who couldn't to tap that market as an investor, accumulated $15 trillion of debt. So that's one of the reasons we have the 1% problem. And now with this kind of investing in the private economy, at whatever level, at $5,000 or $50,000, it's a whole new group of investors, that's going to change the way capital is formed. People think health is too complicated for people to figure out. That's just not true. You meet people every day. We announced a a partnership yesterday with the Epilepsy Foundation. You find a family with epilepsy in it, they know everything about epilepsy. If you care, you will know enough, but most investors will invest in what you give them a chance to because it's something that they care about or they're interested in, and they want to make money. And if you look at the performance of the markets last year, health was one of the most uh, performing asset classes. Let me add a thought too. So um, I'm a professional investor. And, you know, as a team, we are professional investors and we highly curate the deals. So I'd say on, on a spectrum of, uh, of diligence and curation, we're probably on the extreme end. So um, Scott Jordan, for example, has 5,000 companies on his portal and um, in our portal, we're going to have much, much less. Um, you know, as a company, we've raised capital for six, six companies in this approach. Over the last two years, and we raised about 11.5 million, 
and that's fine by us. We're not trying to do a whole lot. Um, so this comes back to the question of you know, diligence and solving the expertise piece. Um, I completely agree with Greg. By the way, I love how creative you guys are in Polywag. It's really interesting. The whole industry needs to be more creative in general, I have to say. Um, but the folks who invest with us, we have physicians who invest, we have oil and gas guys, real estate guys, lawyers, accountants, and a number of the folks who find us, they get really excited about epilepsy. Actually, we have an epilepsy company we're probably going to do a thing with. They get almost irrationally exuberant, I would say, right? I agree with you. They will invest. The question for us is how do we, how do, we do the right thing by them? So we've begun as, as the experts ourselves. We personally curate the deals. We are the professional team. We curate them. But what I've been finding, what we've been finding as a team, is that as we begin to roll this out, we're getting folks around the table who actually can help curate the deals, which is exciting to me because that means this can become scalable to the extent that we begin to where you're going, to the extent we can begin to get some folks around the table who can not only surface deals, and by the way, we see lots and lots and lots of deals, you know, several thousand deals. But if the curation process can become a little more scalable and we can find folks around the table in the crowd of credit investors who actually know what they're doing, not just excited about epilepsy, but they actually understand what it means to be in an FDA regulated space, the value of CMS and reimbursement, the value of clinical uh, adoption incentives for physicians, patient incentives and all those things, um, I think this thing becomes really exciting. So I think over time, our model will become more, more like that. But it's never going to be a high volume thing. It's all about picking the very top piece of the best companies. And frankly, one of the, one of the reasons we're doing this is we think the very best companies often don't get the capital, right? So I'll, I'll get up my soapbox, but those are just some, some thoughts. Did you want to add anything, Scott, on doing Yeah, I mean, that's just a, you know, how do you define complexity? So when you talk about complexity from an investor perspective, it's like, where do they want to invest, right? Stage of development, financing stage, series A, series B, by therapeutic indication. So complexity depends on what the definition from the investor side or from the company side. And the, what you need with these, what's great about these platforms is that it's ease of use. And it's uh, lowering those investment thresholds so, so investors can diversify across a number of companies. I mean, if you think about this, uh, it was just mentioned, seven and a half million accredited investors in this country, only 5% have investments in your companies. Why is that? You know, it is a complex process. It's not easy to get access. They can't diversify, right? And of those 5%, 41% have exposure in venture funds. And then you say, let's, let's take a look at the Kauffman study, right? How effective have VC funds been, right? So the Kauffmans had 99 funds, 16 of them gave them a two times return, 20 of them beat a benchmark by 3%, and 60 of the venture funds, and by the way, we're bankers dealing with venture, but I, these are the facts, 60 of them just returned their money, right? So complexity on the company side, let's take a look at that real quick. So complexity on the company side is how do I find these investors, right? We're all working towards qualifying these accredited investors that want to have access to the next Regenerons, Onyx, Pharmacyclics, et cetera. I should say Intercept too right now. So these very successful companies that accredited investors would love to have access to, but they, don't, they, 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 they can't afford a $50,000 investment, say, in an angel group. So what they're looking for is to lower those investment thresholds so complexity, I equate, just in summary, I, I equate complexity with ease of use in, in, in increasing the efficiency of information flows. So Sean, how do you get more people engaged um, in investing in um, the healthcare industry? Well, one of the things that we've noticed is that a lot of it depends on what a person's reasons for getting involved with investing. At the earliest stages of companies in their seed and series A rounds, most everyone we've talked to, they want to get to know these companies. They want to get, they're passionate about whatever the company is doing and they want to have access to more than just putting money into an investment vehicle. They want to get to know the companies because they're, they're passionate about the disease, they're interested in healthcare, it's part of their career. And so early stage investing has always been about people and replicating that online is really the best way to engage these people because they haven't had a way to do it in the past because as Scott was saying, 
an angel in group, you're fifty thousand dollars to get one investment. And doctor has a couple million dollars, probably not willing to put a half a million dollars at minimum at risk to invest in startups. And so, but you tell him you can diversify for fifty thousand dollars, and all of a sudden he's going to get involved. And and so a combination of kind of a people-focused approach that allows them to get to know what's going on and get to know co-investors and other people that they're investing in these companies with and the companies themselves, combined with this lower access or lower investment threshold to actually create legitimate access for so many more people than historically have had access. And Andrew, um, I think it would be helpful if we had some practical examples of success stories. Can you share a success story with the crowd? Sure. So, um, yeah, I say we've uh, we've had um, some good fortunes in some of the things we've done. So, three of the companies that we've um, raised capital for using this approach um, have had exits, and they all exited last year. So, one exit was Body Media, which is a wearable device um, to, to monitor all kinds of um, phenotypic um, things, including calories, and Jawbone bought it um, for health and wellness and, and weight loss. Another company, um, and Focus, is a company that developed um, a breakthrough innovation for brain aneurysms, and I love this company. This is um, a therapy, it's an implantable device that is catheter-based, and it goes up into the brain through the, the arteries. Uh, a nitinol uh, wire mesh balloon opens up inside the aneurysm space, and it fills the aneurysm and conforms to it. Blood flows in, but blood can't flow out. Within about half an hour, the blood flow has stopped, so the aneurysm essentially is gone. Within about six months, the neointima layer begins to regrow across the arterial opening, so the actual original anatomy is restored. And why does that matter? It matters because um, the current therapies, coils, have to be redone 30%, 40% of the time, and that is brain surgery, a non-trivial exercise. And having to redo brain surgery is not fun. So this company was actually acquired pre-revenue, pre-clinical approval, um, it was acquired just doing its first in-man studies because the results were so promising. A big med tech company showed up and just acquired it preemptively. And you know, for me, I'm doing this because I, I love dramatic clinical outcome plays. And there are lots of reasons why I like them, and that's one of them. If you can demonstrate dramatic improvements to patients, you're going to get strong M&A interest for the, for the company. And the chances that this thing will, will go from the bench to the bedside increase. Um, a third company that I got, got acquired last year is a company called Spinal Modulation, really more of a structured exit. Um, St. Jude showed up and entered into this M&A transaction with them based on milestones worth up to half a billion dollars for um, the chronic pain therapy. And here's a company that figured out that you know, chronic pain really is um, you know, a peripheral nerve to the central nervous system problem. And it is a nerve block. So as pain migrates from the peripheral nerves into the spine, the motor and sensory neurons bifurcate right by the spine in the dorsal and ventral roots. If you block the dorsal root, where the sensory nerves go in, you should be able to stop pain. And it turns out this company has over a 90% success rate of doing that. And you know, patients who've been disabled by pain can literally get their lives back. So these are companies that we invested in, our venture fund invested in it, our credit investor group invested in it, other VCs invested in it. In it. And we march these, these companies through their paces, clinical development, IP, clinical trials, exits. Greg, how about uh, Polywog? Well, Polywog is uh, not a venture fund. Uh, right. uh, or have a venture fund background as Andrew does. Uh, when I was in law school, my housemate was the squash champion in the class. And I wanted to learn to play squash. And he said, well, I'm happy to teach you, but first you have to go spend two weeks in a squash court and figure out where the ball's going to go before I'm going to get in there with you. It's dangerous otherwise. Uh, we are starting, as you know, the Jobs Act general solicitation rules didn't take effect till the end of September last yep. year. So we are going where the ball is going to go. And it's going to go where the new generation of millennials, 10,000 of whom are turning 35 every day for the next 18 years, are going to be investing in the new economy and the private economy and private companies and they're going to do it online, they're going to do it directly. And that's where the ball's going and that's, that's where we're going to measure our success is if we're in the right place when they come into the market. Um, the other thing is we made an announcement yesterday that combined two things that we've been working on for a while. One is 
foundations that want to work with us to identify companies that they have funded that are now ready for private capital and they will market with us so that their donors are aware of the investment opportunity. And on the other hand, we had Dennis Purcell at Aisling Capital, formerly H&Q, um, who is joining us as a special advisor and a shareholder because that continuum from the foundation funded companies to the VC world has to have a connector, which we are going to be. And by this time next year, I'll have a, a lot more detail to that answer. Okay. But uh, our business model is about two months old, so stay tuned. Okay. Scott, you want to share a success story? Well, we launched, you know, it depends. We, we haven't uh, <laughs> raised any financing yet for our company. We launched uh, August 2nd, 2013. We have, it's interesting, if I would tell you what our model's like, we will be fundraising for uh, many companies. We're actually launching this month. But we have a LinkedIn type of an experience. We wanted to build an ecosystem, friending, following, sharing, and messaging. So we feel that, you know, our ecosystem, we have capital sources, which includes venture capitalists and angels. We have accredited investors. We have emerging growth companies, and we have investment professionals. So just like LinkedIn, you can build those connections. You can follow companies. You can get automatic notifications on our, on our site. So what's really interesting is, is we just decided on our model, and there's other real good models here, but on our model, it was imperative that we embraced the current ecosystem. Even though the amount of capital that has been raised for private companies from angels, which in 2012 was about 22 billion, and venture capitalists, which is about 29 billion, that's over 50 billion capital, bottom line is that number has not really accelerated in the last 10 to 20 years. So we saw this unprecedented moment that crowdfunding is. I come from an institutional background. But what's interesting about this is that for the first time in 80 years, I can, I can generally solicit. I was talking with a venture capitalist yesterday, a major venture capitalist. He said, you know what, Scott? We applaud you guys for the creativity that you brought to the marketplace. Because essentially what they said was in 40 years, Nothing has changed, raising money for private companies. And now, if you think about it, 52.7% of investor syndicates between 2007 and 2012 financing events had zero new investors in these venture deals, which means that the distribution of capital is going to a select few companies, as all of you know. There are 62% less venture capitalists today than there was 10 years ago. So where are these companies going to get their money? So we thought that building an ecosystem and doing it the right way for us, that's where we wanted to start. And what we do then is, is we transition from that ecosystem to actually putting deals. We have listed companies with the 5,000, and we have companies that are fundraising. So I'm hoping to share some exciting news here in the next month. We, uh, by the way, our company, uh, Healthios, has our uh, benefactor has raised $2 million in capital since inception, raised $100 million in capital in 2013, of which $14 million was raised from retail credited investors, but it was not through Healthy Oils Exchange. So I don't, want to, I don't want you guys to feel like when you see the $14 million, it came from the, the headsets and, and networks. But that's all going online with e-payments, e-legal, e-compliance, e-due diligence. But Online will never take the place of offline. The expertise of angel groups, the expertise of venture capitalists, the average company raises, successful pharmaceutical company, raises upwards of $50 million over a six year period. Our site cannot raise that kind of money at this point. This is not peer to peer lending. So we need the venture capitalists, we need the foundations, we need the angel groups. And what do the angel groups and the venture firms and the foundation need from us? Premium deal flow, investors, future LPs. So that's, that's enough for me. So you just said that the average successful needs to raise about 50 million. So maybe expand is crowdfunding, can it get you from seed to exit? Not today, absolutely not. But what you do with crowdfunding is you get to a value inflection point where your, where your future loan is repriced. You impact your valuation. You know, you got an IND, you, you had a PKPD study, successful. You got a major collaboration. At that point, the valuation adjusts in your next round, and you attract, you have, at this point, and these gentlemen might differ with me, but 
you know, my boss is expecting huge things out of our site. And I think we're going to achieve it. But at this point, realistically, if you think about what the crowdfunding sites have done thus far, let's talk Circle Up. Circle Up, which is an amazing site in the consumer goods area, which was here yesterday, I think their largest deal, I think, is $3 million. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. So the expectation, guys, is that at this point, you know, maybe three to five is realistic, probably in the next three to five. And like I said, they may differ with my estimation. Greg. So we expect our average raise for our companies to be around $5 million. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, keep in mind that most of the people who are accredited investors who've never made an investment in a private company don't even know that they are accredited investors. They don't even know about the Jobs Act and about the investment opportunity. So this is going to be one of those things that starts slowly and builds. And one Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock, everybody's going to get it. You look at the exchange-traded fund business, which nobody even understood in 2000 or even saw coming. In 2008, it had $50 billion in assets. Today, it has $1.8 trillion in assets. When it started, people said, why in the world would you take your money out of a mutual fund to go into an unmanaged ETF? And now people look at you like you're crazy if you're paying mutual fund fees instead of being in something that's more dynamic. So it's going to happen. And just as an aside, every problem that people see with the equity raised online is from a VC perspective. We don't really care about the problems from a VC perspective. We're interested in the problems from the investor's perspective. So we're not trying to make the world safer for the venture model. Every problem that I've run across in the last year is now a business for somebody. Law firms helping you with accreditation. Law firms helping you with proxy management and offering document management. People offering diligence services to private investors the way they've offered them to hedge funds for years. Everything that you think of as a, as a roadblock is actually an on-ramp to somebody else's business. Okay. Did either one of you? I, I want to jump in and just uh, uh, add a few quick comments. Um, just observations, really. Um, you, Greg and I were chatting yesterday out, out, out of the square about um, where this thing could go. And um, I think we're, we're both pretty excited where it could become. This mindset change, which is not there yet, but we're all helping to, to build that ecosystem. Um, I'll say a few quick comments. One quick comment is that we raised $2.6 million in 14 days last year in August for a deal. And when we began doing this, we did not ever anticipate that kind of response in that short time frame. It's kind of, it's kind of amazing, really. Um, and another piece of that is accessing these deals. You know, as I said before, we're VCs, you run a venture fund. But this venture health um, <coughs> version of it, where accredited investors make individual decisions on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, it's a different kind of capital. It really is. Because the investors, they're the ones making the decision. They're the ones who are empowered. And what's really striking about that, one implication is what it means for entrepreneurs. So a different deal we did last year, Channel Med Systems, um, the founder, Dan Burnett, he had way too much money chasing his deal. He didn't need to let us in. But he did. And why, I wish he was here. Why did he do it? He did it because he said, you know what, I just, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of VCs. <laughs> no offense to me, right? Um, I want to find other alternative ways to capitalize my innovations and I want this kind of model to work. He probably wants all of us to be successful, right? As an entrepreneur, he wants different ways to access capital. And I think that that's powerful. It means we're going to be able to access some interesting deals. And um, it's early days, but you know, how much money could be raised? Right now, we're raising one to three million. Clearly, clearly that number is going to go up right. and up and up. I don't know where it's going to go, but um, it's, it's, it's exciting. Sean, did you want to add anything? Just touching on what everyone else is kind of synthesizing it down to the, the best companies are really going to want capital and connections and talk about ecosystems and wanting to have different types of money coming in and working with foundations and passionate patient advocates and the best companies that are being chased by money that are and even more there's going to be more and more of these companies because there's more capital coming is these accredited investors aren't new they're not idiots. <laughs> I mean, they're really sophisticated people in their own right. They may not have an experience in startup investing and in early stage company investing, but 
an executive or an executive of a healthcare company is going to be enormously valuable to have as an investor for companies that you've never had an access to have someone like that on your cap table. And even if that's only at 10,000 bucks, if they can help you get a champion inside of a company to get you inside and make a sale, that's far more valuable than any sort of connection you've had before. And so it's not just capital that these crowd investors can come. They're, they're highly successful people, all of these accredited investors, and they're going to bring connections and help you execute your business faster than you've been able to in the, fa in the past. All right, thank you. I wanted to open it up to questions, and there's one up here first. Thank you. You should be working now. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll just yell. Hello, uh, Andy Gase from Health Tech Capital. Uh, I mean, most successful companies don't just need money and leave them alone and they'll be successful. What they need is a lot of mentoring and like somebody mentioned, connections, but also allowing them to pivot and change and modify. So in your crowdfunding models, how do you deal with what happens after the funding and how do you help this company you know, get be successful with the hard sweat work that boards typically do? Andy, you want to, you want, you want to try it? Sure, happy to jump in. So that's a great question, and um, we haven't talked much about how our portals um, are driven economically, but um, our, you know, I, think the, I think the approach matters and the incentives matter. So our approach is to basically be driven by carry, right? the share of the profits. Um, we, have, we have some fee, but like Health Funder, the fee is, is, is it's much smaller than a, a typical venture fund. So our incentive is A, get investors into great, great deals, but B, it's really to get that deal to a successful outcome. So our approach right now has been very hands-on. We take board seats. We make connections. We help build the team around the company. And I think that the, the point I made earlier, the real open question, is to what extent we can begin to scale that beyond our current base and bring folks around the table. I, I do think that the investors coming in, some of them are seasoned, successful healthcare executives who understand so, uh, layers of complexity in healthcare. <laughs> Others are rationally exuberant doctors who, you know, um, are helpful in different ways, I, I would say. And so um, I think that part of what we're doing now is helping, at this early stage, we're helping to make those connections happen. Um, can the crowd itself begin to self-catalyze some of that? We think the answer is yes, but we are not there yet. But that's, that's my answer. Yeah. I think, I appreciate the sentiment that all these companies need mentors. I don't think they all think that. And I think that they, when, they, when they, have to, they have to accept that to get money, the record is very unclear as to whether that has really helped companies or hurt a lot of companies. If Vinod Koslet tells us that that is a myth, I'm more inclined to believe it's a myth. When companies need mentors and help, there are many, many ways to get it outside of a financial transaction where you have to take it. So at Polywog, we're happy to help companies meet advisors, meet experts, improve their board, but it is not a requirement for them to be on our platform, nor do the people who will invest through our platform require that, because if you're investing $25,000, you don't expect to run the company. If you're investing a million, you expect to put your finger in the pie, and that has a mixed record. Can I add a point to that? Let me respond to that. Uh, I really like, I like that point. So my first company, we couldn't raise venture money. We couldn't get mentors. We, did, we sold the company for north of 100 million. It worked out really well. Um, I think in some cases, the companies, will, they know what they're doing. And those are great companies to get into. In other cases, they need lots of help. <laughs> lots of help. And part of what we do is try to figure out where they are on that spectrum. And I do think that you know, theses who assume they're always adding value, um, you know, not always the case. So I think we're, we're mindful of that. But I, I do think that um, having the ability to create those connections is helpful, case by case basis. Absolutely. And Scott was going to. Oh, wait a minute. So, and I, I think that's a great question. There is no way that crowdfunding portals today can emulate the, a lot of the support that angel groups like yours, right, and the venture capital community, you know, in time, that could change. So our syndicate program, right, we're launching a syndicate program similar to Angel List. Angel List has done a phenomenal job, I think, with this thing called the syndicate, where you have a lead and you have syndicate members, and, and the syndicate members pay the lead 50% 50 50 carry. 
So there's this tagline that came out recently in a prediction. It says, your next door neighbor is going to become a venture capitalist. Right. But what's interesting about this, and is that that's why having health tech as a lead right, is so important. Because you bring that expertise, you bring that support. So embracing the, the uh, incumbents, the angel groups, the leading in, uh, angel groups like Health Tech Capital in the H HIT space, for example, is paramount. Disruption, will it happen? Good, like iTunes with music, potentially, to some firms. But seed to exit, you're going to have to have partnerships and have the resources and, you know, to move forward. Let, let's take another so, uh, question. I got a two, question right there. Two, two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, out of U.S., uh, are you, do you have a strategy to go out? Are you looking at competitors coming from Europe? And two, uh, have you sliced and diced your online investors to see, uh, some, somebody mentioned how many were turning 35 uh, every day. Is there other data about those people, such as what percentage of them are uh, healthcare professionals, doctors, or others working in the space? So uh, to your second point first, um, Polywog is, is focused on uh, creating a network of physicians that are going to be investors because they should be investing in what they know. And the reason doctors are considered lousy investors is because they've been investing in everything but health. Oil and gas, planes and trains and yachts and real estate, when in fact they should be investing in what they know. Secondly, one thing about the millennial generation coming online is that while it's different now, it's going to be a very similar pattern to when the boomers came online before there was a line in 1981, when the boomers started turning 35. In 1979, the title of Business Week's cover story was The Death of Equities. And that story did not mention the personal computer or demographics. And by 1981, you could invest your pension, your retirement plan in mutual funds. IBM introduced the PC. The market went from 1,000 to 10,000 in 20 years. Stockholders went from 20 million to 100 million in 20 years. So what does that tell you that's going to happen now? The millennials are going to come in and they're going to overwhelm the marketplace. And we know what will happen because it happened before. In terms of international, um, we, you know, I, I was in Singapore recently, incredible interest in what's going on in the, in the polywog space, in the space of our colleagues up here. I've been talking with other countries that have tech transfer programs for companies from Australia, from Israel, who, Canada, who want to come to the U.S. Uh, the JOBS Act requires those companies have a corporate presence in the U.S. to take advantage of it. But this is, uh, you know, the U.S. is behind in launching crowd equity funding. Australia's had it for seven years. Mm -hmm. Italy even got there before we did. So, you know, that's pretty bad when you're behind Italy. Um, because uh, usually it takes them a little while to get organized. But, uh, so this is an international trend, and I, th I think it's going to transform international capital formation very quickly. Good morning. Uh, I'm a serial uh, entrepreneur. I co-founded 24 medical device companies, took four of those public, two by Dennis Purcell, by the way, <clears throat> sold 12, and I am continually starting new businesses with inventors and scientists, et cetera. And all the funding I've raised myself, typically through personal relationships. So I've been sort of following the trends of what's going on in crowdfunding. But to be very honest with you, I'm struggling to appreciate how all this comes to mesh. And the reason I say that is that all the companies that I have <clears throat> help create and raise the funding, I have personal relationships with the investors. I know what their dollar capabilities are, I know what their science contribution is, I know what their business connection is, and, I, and all of that truthfully is very important and very appreciative to me and, and the management of all these companies. So I, um, at this point, you know, as I said, I'm struggling to appreciate because to me it's distant and it's vague. And I wonder if you could help sort of educate me or make me appreciate more where this trend is going. And I guess part of my 
<clears throat> apprehension is, you know, having followed the SEC's sort of largesse in getting this thing off the ground, led me to believe that maybe it's not going to happen. So uh, long-winded, but whatever you can add to my comfort would be helpful. Excellent question. Let me make an analogy for you that I think is appropriate. I have a very good friend who is a, a cancer doctor, and he, is, uh, he was featured in Wired Magazine this month. And I also had a friend who was the deputy director of the National Cancer Institute. When my father got lung cancer at 90, in my little hometown, you couldn't get cancer except on Tuesday and Thursday, because that was the only day the doctors came over from Memphis. And my father had to decide between chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and how was he to know? So I called the deputy director of the National Cancer Institute and asked his advice. I have friends who get diagnosed with cancer. I call my friend who's in Wide Magazine this month, and I ask him for the best doctors and refer referral. That is my personal network to help people with cancer. That is a lousy system for the country because what it means is who you know and where you live may determine whether you get the best treatment or not. So it is my personal network, which I value, but it is not a network that can scale. So in health, we want to create it so that your zip code it doesn't determine whether you live or die by the quality of your health. In investing, we absolutely will always need people like you who are out there putting together these individual companies with your network. The problem is, of the 8 million people that you could have talked to, only 3% have ever invested in a deal, which means we've been leaving a lot of money on the side that could have come into the healthcare space. And because you couldn't generally solicit to that, that group of people, they had no idea what their opportunities could have been. They only could get into those deals if they knew somebody <coughs> who knew somebody if they knew somebody who knew you. So what we are trying to do is not eliminate what you have been doing, but to scale it so that more people who don't know you would have the opportunity to learn about something you're investing in, and whether you know them or not, they could come to the table. I would predict that in some of your investments, if not most, the minimum investment is pretty significant. So people, you know, they needed to know you, trust you, if I'm putting $250,000 into a deal, I'm going to spend a lot more time than if I'm putting 20. And there are a lot more people willing to put in the 20 that will help us raise the tide for all the boats, so to speak. Equity crowdfunding is not big. Title II, uh, the, uh, the approvals in September, with Title II, with general solicitation, Title V, increasing the shareholder base. What's vague is, a, is not accredited investors, right? So I hate to use this term, but rich man's crowdfunding, which is what they're calling the accredited investor side, is very, very defined. What you can do, uh, general, like 506 C's, you know, filing, filing with the SEC, you know, handing them your marketing documents. I mean, the opportunities with general solicitation is incredible. And I will say this: there are 60 billion dollars of capital and friends and family in this country that comes from what? You know, him, you play golf with them. He knows someone. You leverage 80% of the world's populations on social networks in some form or fashion. So the bottom line is you can access those people, you can solicit those investors, you can make it more efficient. You, I mean, can, lower, you can lower the cost. So increase amounts of capital, increase efficiencies, and for all of you out there uh, that can or cannot raise money through venture capital or angel groups, crowdfunding is a magnificent you know development no do not underestimate the jobs act it was probably one of the most and I, i'm sure you guys agree right it was probably one of the most preeminent pieces of legislation that disrupted the status quo in like 80 years i mean general solicitation are you kidding i can solicit you and i have no idea who you are i mean this these are powerful trends we're young we are young peer-to-peer -peer lending Two billion in originations with Lending, Lending Club and Prosper. The banks are quaking and they really are. The banks are like, this is, un, this is, you know, I can just loan you money, right? I don't have to go through a bank. So equity crowdfunding is gonna have a significant impact on the landscape for, for funding private companies globally. 
And we're, I'm, you know, we're all really you know, lucky to be in this position because legislation causes change. And that's where we are today. Yeah, follow up? Yeah, follow up question. Do you envision Absolutely. Let me jump in. Um, so we're doing this. And I think you've, you've, you've asked such a good question. And a guy like you, and I've done this too, raising money from people we know, you want to know your investors generally. And this, is, this to me is something new under the sun because we're able to access new investors without knowing them as well, especially you. So for me, every single investor that comes our way, we're getting to know them. But what's amazing to me is complete strangers from Florida, from Singapore, cold call us. And you know, we screen investors carefully. Some fit, some don't. It's a lot of work to really figure out the investor side of it. Um, but what we're realizing is that we can get comfortable with folks with, with less relationship building time. Um, put, we put a lot of time into it, but we're changing how we think about building that side of it. And um, when we invest in companies, everything we invest in already has other capital on the table. Other folks are in, other VCs are in, and so on. And um, what's really happening is we're expanding the access you have to build your relationships, and, and, and for us too. And to what extent it makes sense for you, it's a personal decision, right? I think some folks are very happy with what they have. Others kind of like the fact this is something new and, and it's a different way of, of interacting with investors and building their investor community base. And one point kind of following on for that, we look at the types of transactions that are occurring online now and the ways that people have, in all sorts of industry, industries, have created this ability to create trust between transacting parties. I mean, look at Airbnb, for example. That, if you aren't familiar with it, it's where individuals in cities will say, I'm going to let a stranger stay at my home for the night and sleep in a, my extra bedroom. And that happens, and they're huge. They're one of the most high-flying Silicon Valley. They have ex exponential growth based off of a very <laughs> intimate transaction. And there's a lot of, the, the internet is maturing in the way that we assess and look at reputability, credibility, trust, and we're seeing the types of markers that need to exist for trust. And so what all of us are doing in various ways is we're replicating trust online. We're using the credibility indicators that have developed over the last 10 years that allow us to share pictures of our children online, stay in other people's houses, there's car sharing services, and putting that into the investment world so that we can expand, entrepreneurs can expand their reach of who is their personal network that trusts them. And that's a really amazingly great thing that allows us to have much broader reaches than has ever really been possible in the past. And Sean. just for the fact, I stay at Airbnb, I, I almost exclusively stay through Airbnb now because I have much better experiences than I would at a hotel. You just described a very key piece of what is making this work. Thank you. That's exactly right. So I think the answer to your question is, is that online meets offline. So, you know, like in our portal, you have a company page, you have followers, you have investors, you have team members. You're trying to nurture those followers into investors. Those investors can go offline, they can, they can go through the portal, right? They can do either one. But the bottom line, in the future, it's going to, in, in my estimation, there will be a connection with offline and online investing. But the power of social media networks, take a look at LinkedIn, right? Over 350 million people, it's called the network effect. Everybody wants to be on it. You're on it, I'm on it, so, you know, and then everybody else joins, or you, I want to join you guys. So the great thing is, is that the social, for, for the first time, we're going to leverage social media, we're going to leverage the technology, and we're going to take advantage of a piece of legislation that's given us the opportunity to generally solicit. So that's we have a question back here. Yeah. So um, I'm interested in knowing on your platforms and in the deals that you've done, um, what the average number of investors is in the deals that have closed and whether that's increasing and whether you think the scale 
if it does increase, is going to be hard to manage for those issuers after the fact as the investor base uh, grows wider. I guess that's me. <laughs> All of our dealers have had less than 50 investors. I'll say that. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I think about deals we've done, deals that raise one million and deals that raise closer to three million. Um, the number of investors does increase, but it's not linear. Um, um, we'll see where it goes, but the reality is, you know, Scott was mentioning rich man's crowdfunding. Um, we go pretty ultra high net worth, and that's only increasing. In fact, as we do this more, we're finding uh, that family offices are becoming more interested. So instead of um, getting folks who can write smaller checks, we're getting folks who can write bigger checks. Um, but right now, we're, we're not that worried about it. I mean, you know, right now, the investors we pick, we, ma we manage them reasonably well. And as this thing develops over time, and I hope it becomes as big as we're all hoping it becomes, um, we have a number of ways we, we see to manage that. Um, but from the work we do, I doubt the investors will ever be in more than 100 or 200 per deal. And if that happens, that is years down the road. I don't, I don't know what the motivation behind your question It could be, if the motivation behind your question is, you know, a fractured cap structure, right? That's the biggest, one of the biggest things you hear, right? I don't want to have to report to 100 investors. We're all using, I think we're all using special purpose vehicles, right? LLCs. You're not, okay, my, my bad. So we're using a special purpose vehicle where we aggregate investors and you consolidate voting and communication. Otherwise, it is an investor relations nightmare. The other thing is, is that the follow-on capital, the venture capitalists and whatnot, they don't want fractured cap structures. So they avoid it. So for us, you know, being top down, we started, you know, we're institutional coming down into crowdfunding. We feel that for us, the special purpose vehicles alleviate that concern that companies have that they don't want, you know, a hundred people on the cap structure that came in at 10 grand. So. We, we, we do one cap table, one cap table entity coming in. Yeah. We're on the other side of that equation. We, we, we are not afraid of companies having more people on their cap table. We do not use a special purpose vehicle. We think that limits liquidity for the investor. Um, we think that a good company is going to be a good company regardless of how many people are on the cap table and a company you're not interested in is a company you're not interested in. So. This is one of those problems that's going to be a business opportunity to manage the proxies and the communication with the investors. And, uh, and frankly, as, as uh, one investor said in a discussion yesterday, it means you have to buy you know, 50 more stamps. It doesn't mean that you have to completely revolutionize investor relations. Keep in mind, the 100 people with $10,000 are not expecting to run your company. But the companies that we're raising money for would gladly trade the irritation of a squeaky wheel to be able to get funded because if they could easily get funded, they wouldn't be talking to us. Thank you. We're done. I want to thank uh, the panel members. Good job. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.